Before I go back to discussing financial matters, I'm going to do another video on nutrition to talk about a very popular belief nowadays, which is that dietary carbohydrates are bad for you and lead to fat storage. While it's true that a caloric excess maintained for many days will trigger the body to store fat, peer-reviewed scientific literature suggests a very different role of carbohydrates in this process. I emphasize here my use of the words peer-reviewed scientific literature. The reason for this being that many of us are not scientists, and so most of us don't read the details of the actual scientific studies. Thus, when we rely upon the posts of bloggers and the opinions of those who try to sell us books and products, we miss out on the understanding needed to discern truth from conjecture. With that said, let's discuss the metabolism of dietary carbohydrate and see what some of the peer-reviewed journal studies can tell us. Here is an abstract from a paper in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition written in 1988. The principal investigator was Kevin Atchison. It is widely cited and is available for free online for anyone who would like to do their own research. What this study set out to do was to investigate the impact of vastly overfeeding men carbohydrate to see how their bodies handled the excess. The first step in the study was to deplete the stores of glycogen in the muscles and the liver of these men. This was important because in addition to fat, glycogen is another way in which the body stores energy for later use. When the body is in a fasted state, it can rely on both glycogen as well as body fat to supply the energy needed to function. The researchers depleted the glycogen of the subjects by putting them on a severely carb-restricted diet for three days. They then gave them a seven-day diet that was very high in carbohydrates and very low in fat, where the calorie consumption was more than twice what would be required for maintaining a stable weight. The outcome of this test was threefold. First, the excess carbohydrates did not turn immediately to fat. It was not until muscle and liver glycogen stores reached their maximum that the body converted carbohydrates to body fat in a process known as de novo lipogenesis. Second, the capacity of the liver and muscles to store glycogen was much higher than previously thought. Third, as the glycogen levels in the muscles and the liver increased, the body would increase its rate of oxidation of the carbohydrates, which reduced the amount of energy available to go to fat storage. Here we see a plot illustrating their findings. Initially, during the overfeeding phase, starting on day four, when the men were eating twice what they needed, their bodies responded by switching over to carbohydrate metabolism, where about 1,600 calories were used for immediate energy and the rest were converted to glycogen. On the second day of overfeeding, with the glycogen levels partially restored, the metabolic rate increased and their bodies burned an extra 400 calories a day of carbohydrate for energy. In other words, the impact of depleting muscle glycogen due to a low-carb diet is to reduce the rate of burn of carbs for energy by about 400 calories per day. As the days passed, the glycogen stores continued to increase, and as they did, their bodies started converting more and more of the excess calories to body fat. But it took several days to get there. Thus, the body has significant glycogen stores for maintaining a short-term energy reserve. Now here's a kicker that should interest everyone. It's related to the fact that the body will increase its rate of metabolism when its glycogen stores are nearly full. What the authors found was that during the course of the overfeeding, where the subjects ate twice what they needed for maintenance, only 75% was retained as glycogen and body fat. The other 25% of it was dissipated. In fact, it was noted that the excess rate of dissipation reached close to 30% of the excess calories consumed. Now this is a very interesting finding, and one that I will touch on more in a little bit. What it hints at is that a calorie is really not a calorie. The process of converting a carbohydrate calorie to fat is an expensive one in which quite a bit of the energy is lost. Now this is not to say that consuming excess calories won't make you fat so long as the bulk of it is carbohydrate. Far from it. What it does say is that your body will naturally up its rate of metabolism when its glycogen stores are full. This increases the amount of calories that you can consume before you will start storing fat. Now let's move on to another article in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition written a little earlier 
in 1985 by Elliot Danforth, titled Diet and Obesity. Again, this one is available for free if you do a Google search, and so I encourage you to read it when you have the time to digest the full paper. It's what scientists call a survey paper in that it was a historical account of other scientific studies. It is still valid though because it's a peer-reviewed journal and all of the citations are made available for the public to read and verify. In this article is introduced a diagram showing the percentage of dietary calories that are expended in various ways. The largest component of daily energy expenditure is the resting metabolic rate. This is the energy used by your body when it's completely sedentary. It supports all of the vital bodily functions, plus provides the energy necessary to think, see, sit upright, and so on. This represents 65 to 75 percent of daily caloric expenditure, and you burn this without going to the gym or exercising outdoors. On top of this is a small energy burn that is caused from doing muscular work. This is the thermic effect of exercise. It will be different for everyone and will depend upon the pattern of exercise in terms of the level of exertion and duration. Regardless, it tends to be fairly small compared to the resting metabolic rate. Nearly as consequential as the thermic effect of exercise is the thermic effect of food. Most people don't know this, but a considerable amount of energy from the food that we take in is consumed in the process of digestion, absor absorption, and storage of nutrients. But this excludes things like real simple sugars, which take almost no energy to digest. And that's what this piece is. It's pretty considerable. Finally, there is another piece called adaptive thermogenesis, which represents the amount of energy that is dissipated as heat. Generally, when the body is well fed, it will tend to run warmer, simply because it has the excess energy to do so. What differentiates this from the thermic effect of food is that the thermic effect of food can be considered the energy that is lost from the process of digestion, whereas adaptive thermogenesis is more of a persistent state that occurs even when there is no digestion taking place. This helps to explain why metabolic rate tends to go up when glycogen stores are reasonably full. The body senses that it is not in starvation mode and will use some excess uh, glycogen energy stores to stay warmer. The origin of this effect is special mitochondria in brown adipose tissue surrounding the organs of the body. Oops, I introduced a new term here. Adipose is simply a fancy word for fat. But back to the paper. After discussing the various ways in which dietary calories are used, the author cited the Vermont studies of the effects of long-term overeating. In this study, there were eight male volunteers. Four of these volunteers were overfed a diet containing a mix of macronutrients for seven months. The other four were overfed a diet containing only fat for three months. What was found in this study was that for the same gain in body fat, it took significantly higher amounts of excess calories from a mixture of fat, protein, and carbohydrate than it did when only fat was consumed. In other words, something else was happening to the carbohydrate and the protein aside from conversion to body fat. Some of it was not being stored. The author then went on to cite literature from 1978 that quantified the metabolic costs of converting macronutrients to fat. Dietary fat can be converted easily with only 3% uh, metabolic penalty, whereas it takes 23% of the calories from carbohydrates to go through the metabolic pathway necessary to turn the carbohydrate into fat. By contrast, it only costs 7% of the energy in carbohydrates to store the excess energy from carbohydrates as glycogen. Thus, the body's preferred pathway is to store fat as fat, store excess carbohydrate as glycogen, and only when the glycogen stores are full does it start to store carbohydrate as fat. And even then, it comes with a pretty stiff caloric penalty. And this penalty comes on top of the adaptive thermogenesis effect, where the body naturally increases its energy expenditure to increase the rate of generation of heat. Pretty interesting stuff, huh? Danforth then presented some findings from Atchison in research published a year earlier that discussed measurements of the thermic effect of food based upon the composition of the diet leading up to a big meal. What was found was that for subjects that were on a high-fat diet, 
the consumption of an unusually large meal afterward would result in 5% of the excess calories being dissipated as heat. By contrast, subjects who were consuming a diet higher in carbohydrates on a percentage basis would see more than 8% of their excess calories from a big meal dissipated as heat. It was the same big meal, but less of it was converted to fat. The impact came from how the body adapted to earlier carbohydrate consumption. Now, there are many, many more journal articles, and I obviously can't go into them all in a short YouTube video. My intent was to simply provide you with a taste of some of the interesting scientific work out there that discusses the role of carbohydrate in metabolism, fat, and glycogen storage. I'd encourage everyone to go out and do some research because there's a lot of it out there and much of it is at odds with what we are hearing now from those promoting low carbohydrate diets. But before I stop this video, I'd like to summarize. What we can see from the studies is that high carb or low carb, a person will put on weight in the form of body fat if more calories are consumed than expended over a long period of time. When excess calories are consumed, the body will store the excesses at first to minimize losses whenever possible. Fat is easily stored as body fat with only 3% of the energy needed to make the process happen. Carbohydrate will be stored first as glycogen because it's a process that wastes only 7% of the calorie content of the food. Once the glycogen levels are full, the body will increase its metabolism quite a bit in order to regulate the glycogen levels. Typically, this means an additional 400 calories per day may be burned. If caloric consumption is in excess of even this elevated level, then there will be a conversion of the carbohydrate into body fat, but this process comes with a steep metabolic cost of 23 to 30% of those extra calories. All of this is not to say that I'm promoting a lifestyle where a person can pig out with impunity by simply eating a high carbohydrate, low fat diet. Quite the contrary, I think overconsumption of food can have a pretty nasty long-term health impact. What I am saying is that carbs are not the boogeyman that the popular dietary trends would have you believe. In fact, a high carbohydrate diet can be quite healthy and satisfying, provided the carbohydrates are coming from unprocessed sources and not syrups, refined sugars, or processed flours. It is quite possibly the processing that creates the problems not the consumption of plants, fruits, starches, and grains. But don't take my word for it. Spend some time and get acquainted with the medical research. Question all of the information that you hear, especially opinion pieces that are published as books and blog posts. Look especially for conflicts of interest where they might be occurring. Yes, it's a lot of work, but this is the only way to separate truth from conjecture.